policies, protocols, and practices that will protect us and steer us clear of the wrath of COVID. We know we will be impacted. We know that. Our duty is to minimize the impact on lives and livelihoods of our people in this country. But doing this will require a formula, a formula for national success. We will need to come together as one and to surmount the challenges. Indeed, we will need, as some would say, to ride the tide together. One year ago, I felt we were on course to doing this. Yes, we had separate and distinct interests, but our first year of the COVID experience was one in which we rallied as a people to the cause, and we huddled under the strength of the national flag, buoyed by all that it proffers and represents. In more recent times, and with the onset of what is familiarly known to us as the silly season, we have observed a gradual deterioration in national reasoning, national focus, and national consideration, regrettably. For many, it's no longer a case of distinguishing right from wrong, but more so it is one's right to do right or one's right to do wrong, irrespective, regrettably, of the national consequences. For many, my right to say what I wish and my right to do as I choose has now replaced the consideration of what is best for Barbados. Were we a country of 300 million people, as opposed to the current one that is less than a hundredth of that number, then it would probably not matter how many weakened or even broken links there are in the national chain. The sheer size and might of numbers would prevail. We saw it in China and we saw it in India with respect to the impact of the very pandemic on their respective societies and economies. The number of casualties had to be contextualized in relation to the size of their populations. But here in Barbados, we do not have the luxury of discounting a single fallen soul. Not a single one, I tell you. That is why, for example, we continuously provide you with daily updates on cases and fatalities. We tell you how many people have no symptoms, mild symptoms, ill or gravely ill. And we do this because when you only have 280,000 souls on an island, trust me, my friends, each of us feels it when a life is lost. This is why we have worked so hard to protect the lives of our people. That is why we were first out of the box with the procurement of vaccines. That is why when we heard our neighbors to the north and in Europe and in Asia sneezing, we knew eventually we would catch a cold. And in this instance, it was COVID. It was for that reason that we proactively built Harrison's Point in four weeks from a derelict and abandoned structure at the end of February 2020. It was for that reason that we invested in a facility and in the equipment that anticipated the best, but also, my friends, prepared us for our worst case scenarios. Our physical facilities may not be five star. Indeed, they're not. Were we to provide five star health amenities, we would perhaps not be able to educate every boy and girl from kindergarten all the way to PhD, absolutely free of charge ever since this government was elected in 2018, may I remind you. Were we to resolve every chink in the healthcare system, we would probably still be at the stage where 40% of the country would still be receiving no running water, where garbage would still be uncollected for weeks and public transportation would still be a mess, leaving people unable to get home at night after a long day's work or sometimes not even to get to work in the morning. And here again, I'm not speaking about these things from 30 or 40 years ago. I'm speaking about these things that have taken place in recent memory, in recent memory when we inherited and took over. These were the conditions that permeated the society when we assumed office three and a half years ago. We've had, my friends, to balance the expenditures. We've had to cut and contrive. We've had to keep agriculture alive at a time with tourism non-existent when the demand for produce fell to an all-time low. We still remember the stories yes, last year when people had increased production, 
but reduce markets because of COVID. We had 90% of the tourists not come to this country for the first time since Barbados had a structured tourism industry since Grant Lee Adams established the Barbados Development Board in the late 1950s. We've had to keep public offices employed. Even when offices were closed and revenue streams were not flowing, as we lost, as you know, virtually a third of our revenue last year as a government. We have had to maintain services to our seniors and less fortunate when revenues dipped to unprecedented levels. We've had an economy decline by 17.6% last year, a level unknown to us before, unknown to all other tourism and travel dependent countries in the world, and at a time when that decline takes us back to output levels of 2006, which is 15 years ago, and in real terms, probably to the late 1990s. Lockdowns of the nature that we have endured could have paralyzed this economy along with the declines to which I have spoken, were it not for the foresight of this government in forming strategic alliances at the point at which we did. We have been therefore capable of benefiting from those alliances and those programs that we have put in place. That is why, my friends, I find it so lamentable that we are today accused of responding positively to the precepts entered into with the International Monetary Fund three and a half years ago when they have aided us in our darkest hour of need and at a price that was not comparable to any other cost of capital any other part of the world. I read the papers today and I asked myself, does anyone recall the days of 23 downgrades? Does anyone recall the days of a highly threatened currency parity when the value of the Barbados dollar was at risk? Does anyone recall when basic services were not available from departments of governments, when Bush on both sides of the road grew to block vehicular access? Or does one remember that sewage flowed in the streets of this nation with travel advisories coming left, right, and center? Does anyone remember that we assumed office on the 25th of May with four weeks of import cover for foreign reserves, with a debt payment due within less than three weeks that would have taken responsibility for at least another just over one week of import cover. Formerly, my friends, we heard of failing tests and downgrades. That was the language that was being used before this government came to office. Now today, there is a complaint that we are too focused on passing IMF tests. From when does the passing of an IMS test not be in the best interest of Barbados and Barbadians? For real. We are told that we must bring a budget. But my friends, the budget has been completed each and every year in accordance with the Constitution of Barbados in March when we do the estimates. Because if there is no need to find further financing for the budget, all that of the work is completed when we therefore pass the appropriations bill in the estimates debate. And if we do actually need further economic measures, we may do this then or at any other time during the year, as we have done on so many occasions in the last two years. In particular, I recall for you the BEST program, which was developed to protect the tourism sector. So my friends, why in 2021 is this rocket science? Believe you me, we will complete the agreements that we have entered into, whether it is with the IMF or whether it is working with our other partners of international financial institutions. Perhaps if others had taken the time to meet with the fund when its members came a-calling, they would better understand now what is going on, rather than speaking so ill-advisedly about matters clearly out of their depth. At the, end of the, at the end of the day, the best gauge of the confidence in the management of this economy is the actions taken by others and the judgments made by others. I don't need to remind you that only in this month of December already that we had literally a positive outlook proffered for the management of this economy as well as a maintenance of our credit ratings rather than the downgrades to which I referred. And I referred to the 
actions and judgment made by Standard & Poor's a few weeks ago, and more recently by Carrie Chris, the regional rating agency, that they both have confidence in the management of this economy. They have held their judgment as to our credit rating, and in fact, they have given us positive outlooks in circumstances where many other nations have neither received either a positive outlook for the future or were able to maintain their credit ratings as a result of what has come to be regarded as the most awful time economically because of the COVID-19 pandemic. But my friends, the silly season diatribe is in vogue. And in the silly season, persons are expected to speak not what is true or what makes sense, but more so what grabs headlines and what portrays one's political opponent in a negative light. We've been around too long, we know it. It is also in such silly seasons that one half of a party would call out persons to strike and the other half of the party says the strike is none of their business. That happens in the silly season. It is also in the silly season that the second oldest political party in the country would be oozing blood from all of its vital organs due to a lack of inspired and inspiring leadership perhaps, but all senior members remain silent because it is too close to elections to do anything. That is what the silly season does to you. To borrow a term from the chief medical officer, we are not in a good place. When something as harmless as a VAT-free day is criticized on the basis of inadequate consultation. I've heard of VAT-free and duty-free days all over the world. And the notion of consulting on these initiatives before and long before where people can change their behavior is not something that we can support because it will be counterproductive. Think about it. It is like the Drug Enforcement Division of the Barbados Police Service serving notice that they will search all vehicles traveling on the ABC Highway next Thursday evening from 9 p.m. to midnight. <laughs> what do you think will happen then? The logic of some in our midst, my friends, is absolutely mind-boggling. All reason, fair play, and common sense are now sacrificed on the altar of political expediency simply because we are in the silly season. Government is accused of high expenditure, yet no consideration is given to the fact that the hundreds of persons employed in recent months to debush the island, to remove the ash from the island, and to maintain our highways are all still employed. The fiscal and economic purists would prefer that we let them go because they are not generating revenue. Well, I'm saying that I will not take bread off their tables now or at any time in the near future. They are doing a marvelous job and we are banking on the coming on stream of initiatives that will see many of them absorbed in other sectors. But the idea of sending people home in the middle of a pandemic merely to cut the expenditure when the government has so ordered its arrangements to be able to protect the most vulnerable is not an option. When I know that the private sector itself is still struggling to get back on its feet and we will still need a few more months to kick off some of the major projects which I'll refer to shortly. The bottom line is, is that in the absence of an aggressive private sector, the government has to be the one to respond to being able to close that gap if we are going to make sure that people are not left on the side of the road suffering without access to things that they need to keep body and soul together. And we've not been speaking publicly about everything that we have been doing, but I'm telling you, my friends, the horizon is bright for the startup of the major projects in 2022. Within the last month, I've met with the principals or representatives of a number of firms who are undertaking major projects in our country. We expect the Royalton Hotel in Holtown, where the old Discovery Bay was, to break ground within the first two months of, of 2022. We expect Hyatt, finally, to break ground as well. We expect the Pearhead project within the first six months in Bridgetown to break ground. We expect a new townhouse project next year at Porters in St. James. We expect a very large cineplex and commercial center at Welch's in St. James, and you see the work digging out there for it. We expect a green energy park at Vaucluse, subject now only to the tariffs that will be applicable 
to get that project off the ground and going. And this list, my friends, is by no means exhaustive, as there are many other private sector projects, including the redevelopment at Apes Hill that is going on as we speak, including the completion of Sam Lord's Castle. And of course, there is the other part of the castle lands, which has just gone out to tender and will be shortly awarded. I have not included in there the project also at Whole Tongue for a new civic complex and new hotel complex within Whole Tongue so that we can create far more jobs for our people. And my friend, all of them have given start updates for the most time between January and June of next year. This does not include the Beaches project, which is being redesigned and should finish with the redesigns by the middle of the year. Does it, nor does it include Margaritaville at Hastings, which still has a number of public meetings to do in order to be able to commence. This is not me Motley saying this for political gain. And I invite the media to pick up the phone and to call the CEOs or the chairman of any of the aforementioned establishments and ask for a breakdown of their startup schedule in Barbados. So believe you me, I am not worried about the economic revival as we go into 2022. That is not my major concern going into next year. We have worked hard to bring back tourism. Almost 90% of the airlift that we had in December 2019 has returned in December 2021. And we will continue to work hard with the partners to make tourism thrive in spite of the ongoing threat of COVID because the world over, we are learning to live with it because it is truly a marathon. We will in the new year also find ways and means of creating safe environments for workers and for patrons alike. Some have said the government is too draconian. Others say the government is too timid. I say we are too mature and intelligent not to find a way. We will negotiate as best we can and for as long as we can. I am confident that Barbadians shall rise to the challenge of making Barbados a safe and comfortable environment to live, to holiday, to do business. So my worry going into 2022 revolves around the impact of the silly season on our tone and our tenor as a nation. The impact of the silly season on our actions and our utterances. The impact of the silly season in our ability to think Barbados and what is best for this little paradise in the middle of the sea. What is best for our future as a nation. I believe that we thrived and succeeded in 2018 and 2019 because an election was behind us and we united as a force against first the fiscal and economic threats and then later the onslaught of COVID. I believe that as a united Barbados that we will and have always been unbeatable. The fact is that we set out to save the Barbados dollar and we were able to do so. We set out to restructure our debt, and we were able to do so. And we were able to put ourselves in a position that, quite frankly, had we not done what we did in the first 19 months, we cannot even begin to think about where Barbados would be tonight without those actions taken by this government in the first 19 months. Were it not for the emergence of the silly season, persons in Barbados, in my view, would therefore be calling a spade a spade. They would be saying what is right and what is wrong. They would be supporting policies and programs designed to protect and safeguard this country, its inhabitants, and those who do us the honor of visiting as vacationers or on business. That is why, my friends, I am concerned that we should not enter 2022 as a divided nation. Were I motivated solely by the need to survive we could bask, my friends, in the glory of a 29-1 parliament and ride COVID out for the next 18 months. Defeating COVID would not be a benchmark. Surviving it would be the acid test. Were I motivated solely by what is in the interest of the Barbados Labour Party, I would say run the innings down to the last ball and hedge my bets that by June of 2023, we would be emerging, if not having already emerged, from the brunt of the COVID pandemic. But my friends, my worry is now. 
I'm concerned that if we start 2022 as a divided nation, we will stunt and frustrate our own progress. And what we do today stands to affect this country for the next 20 to 30 years. And we are willing to take the risk because we would rather depart, leaving Barbados on course to recovery than grapple for the next 18 months with a divided nation, not making the most of the opportunities that this new COVID environment presents. I'm prepared to make those decisions, even if it means foregoing the next 18 months of this government's term that was received with 74% of the popular vote. Why? Because Barbados and Barbadians deserve better. And simply remaining at the crease to say that you were at the crease has never been a successful measure to be able to attain progress in this nation, not in cricket, not in politics, not in nation building. I spoke earlier of the many projects about to break sod and start in earnest in 2022. And I have not dealt with government's own capital works program. Everything I mentioned to you is the private sector. If you go up to Valerie later this week, you'll see the beginning of the installation of the first of those 150 houses that were purchased from China to be able to help us with the victims of Hurricane Elsa and the freak storm, while still having 350 houses built by ordinary Barbadian companies and craftsmen. I'm told that it is already exciting, significant, generating significant excitement among builders and prospective homeowners alike. Indeed, far from questioning the structural integrity of these homes, local builders are now saying that the specifications provided by the Chinese are far too rigid and strong, as they are designed more for a fortress rather than a regular two or three bedroom home in Barbados. But my friends, I don't mind. COVID has taught us that we can never be too safe. There are other capital works projects like the Scotland District Rehabilitation Project that will see the roads of the Scotland District for the first time in decades systematically addressed and dealing with the whole question of erosion. And I can go on and on whether it is the water projects that have already started to deliver for our people or whether it is the continued expansion of the transport program. Those are many of the public sector projects that we will continue and you will hear much of them. So projects and programs as a factor, we're in a good place going into 2022, believe you me. Behavior and attitudes are our bigger concern. And I want us to unite as a people and to work as one. And why? My friends, Omicron is coming and it is going to impact us. It is true that they do not expect it to be as serious as Delta in terms of the individual consequences for individuals, but it is coming. And I need Barbadians to approach and fight Omicron as one country, as one nation, as one people. I want us to roll back our shirt sleeves and to work as one to climb our way out of COVID and back into social and economic cohesion and prosperity. You know, when you pick up a report, the first thing that they say about our country always Barbados' social capital, Barbados' level of trust. That is what takes us through. And that is why I believe that it is so vitally necessary, my friends, right now, to end this silly season. Because if you ask me after 30 years, what is the greatest virtue that this country has? It is the trust and the social capital. The behavior that I'm seeing emanating from certain quarters and certain positions of influence in this country they're not consistent with who we say we are and who we know ourselves to be. In the words of the right excellent Earl Walton Barrow, we're not creating or depicting a positive mirror image of ourselves. Accordingly, I've taken the decision that as a nation, we should go to the ants, consider her ways and be wise. On this, the 27th day of December, 2021, I've decided that it would be in the interest of Barbados our country, our home, that we recalibrate as a people behind one government and one leader. And let me say, whoever emerges as that leader, I will support. I will do my utmost to promote the interests of Barbados and Barbadians in all that I say and do, as I've done in all of my public career, and will continue to do until the Lord takes my breath. I would like to ask this of every Barbadian tonight. Our country demands it of us, and our people deserve it from us. We are currently divided. We are currently drifting philosophically 
and ideologically on quite a few things. I need for us to unite around a common cause. Unite behind a single government, unite behind a single leader. And let us unite to fight the threats to our safety, our development, and our prosperity. Accordingly, my friends, I earlier this evening met with Her Excellency, the Most Honorable Dame Sandra Mason, President of Barbados, and advised that she dissolve the current Barbados Parliament with immediate effect. I further advised Her Excellency that she, not on behalf of Her Majesty the Queen, but in her own right as President of the Republic of Barbados, issue writs for the holding of the new elections in Barbados. I know that we're still in the midst of COVID, but as we've all agreed, COVID will be with us for a while. It is my intention to have meetings convened of the Electoral and Boundaries Commission and the COVID Cabinet Subcommittee so that they may advise how best we structure the actual voting process to reflect an appreciation of the realities of COVID in our midst. I will also ensure that the leader of the opposition and, and myself are fully briefed after these meetings and that we can update you in a manner, matter of days on any agreed upon changes with respect to simplifying the conduct of elections in this environment. I'm thinking, for instance, that we could increase the number of rooms to accommodate polling in a facility while you still vote. So, for example, at the St. Leonard Secondary School, we could shorten the alphabetical size of a station so that there are shorter times because there are more rooms within which people can vote. And the lines, therefore, will be shorter for the persons who have to vote. And that's just me thinking aloud, but I'm sure that our technical officials will meet as early as possible and thrash these issues out. Yes, Barbados is special. Barbados is mature. And Barbados can and will conduct elections in a safe and responsible manner, even in the midst of COVID. And we shall have the will of the people determined and declared in a minimum time. My friend, others have done it. We can do it too. It is for that reason, therefore, that I've advised Her Excellency to set the 3rd of January 2022 as a nomination day in Barbados. Fellow citizens and long-standing residents, the date on which you shall go to the polls and elect your next government and your next leader to lead this country through Omicron, to lead this country through the difficult times that we are still managing through COVID and back to social and economic harmony and prosperity, to lead this country to be in world class is January the 19th, 2022. I urge each and every one of you to go out and exercise your democratic franchise, a franchise preciously given to us by Sir Grantley Adams and exercise for the first time, yes, just some 70 years ago, believe it or not, just simply 70 years ago, Barbadians had the right to vote for the first time without reference to property or without reference to any other consideration other than citizenship, residency, and age. We have, my friends, a country to build out. And we have a people to mold. Let us go on, confident that if we can do so united as a people, there is no, no major challenge that can knock us down for the count fully. And let us demonstrate to the world why it is said always, always, that Barbados is that country that punches way above its weight division. Because when it truly matters, whether it was for the Caribbean Court of Justice, whether it was for the many other issues that we've had to confront, our people have come together as one to fight the major challenges of our generation on each occasion. May God bless each and every one of you for 2022. And may God bless our country, Barbados. And may we settle to make those decisions that will make us even stronger and stronger than we currently are. I thank you. Good night.